What does Death Cab for Cuties 2003 LP Transatlantic System have to do with a 1982 children's animated fantasy and adventure film? What's the connection? And was it purposeful or just some random coincidence? Today, I am going on a journey to explore these questions in a deep dive down an Alice in Wonderland worthy rabbit hole. Hey fellow music nerds, it is Andy with the Fence Post Vinyl channel. If you like vinyl or you dig learning about the music you love, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, then ring that little bell so you are notified of new videos when they go live. Okay, so it all began with a comment many, many months ago on my video discussing Death Cab for Cuties Transatlanticism album at 20 years old. The original comment was by Jack Carraway, 4707. They stated, fun fact, the cover art is a reference to Jeremy in The Secret of Nim. He was collecting red string as a means to attract a mate, and the main theme of transatlanticism is love. Then, a few weeks ago, came a response by, and I love this name, Pickle Killa. Is this true? I'm not finding any info on it when I search online. I'd love for it to be true. I decided to take on the challenge and investigate. Hey honey, uh, where's my Sherlock Holmes hat? She threw it out. In this video, I'll start by taking a brief look at The Secret of Nim. I'm gonna dig much deeper into the metaphoric, symbolic, and thematic elements that pop up throughout transatlanticism, and I'll explore the known history of the album art, and I'll try to answer the question once and for all. Is Transatlanticism's artwork a direct reference to Jeremy from The Secret of Nim? The story originated as a children's fantasy fiction book titled Miss Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien in 1971 with illustrations by Zena Bernstein. In 1982, it was then adapted to an animated film dubbed The Secret of Nim. To boil down the plot of the film to one single sentence might sound a little something like this. Widowed Mouse Miss Brisby must go on a painstaking journey to relocate her family at an incredibly stressful time. And yes, they did change the first letter of her name for the film adaptation. That said, let's explore Nim a bit further. On this arduous journey to relocate her family, Miss Brisby encounters Jeremy Crow, who is a crow. Crow is often referred to as a deuteragonist, or the person second in importance to the protagonist in storytelling, in this case, Miss Brisby. He's also referred to at times as a tritagonist, which, you guessed it, the person who is third in importance to the protagonist in storytelling. A more modern day example of, say, a tritagonist being kind of the secondary sidekick to the protagonist would be Hermione Granger to Harry Potter, or even the duo of Princess Leia and Han Solo to Luke Skywalker. Jeremy's role is relatively small, but it is critical to Miss Brisby's journey in both the aid that he provides as well as being her friend and cohort. To understand the nature of the relation between transatlanticism and the secret of Nim, we need to explore Jeremy's character a little further. Jeremy Crow is a clumsy black crow who is allergic to cats. He is fearful, faint-hearted, and scares quite easily. This tells me he's maybe a little bit of a hopeless romantic filled with hints of insecurity and likely a fair share of anxiety as well. Yet he doesn't let that get in the way of his quest for love and his desire to go out of the way to help those he cares about. In his own journey, as noted in the original book from 1971, he is seeking a love nest. This ties into the presence in the film and thus to transatlanticism's cover art. He befriends Miss Brisby as follows. Brisby encounters Crow, quote, trying to free himself from red string, which he says is for a nest. There's the tie-in between transatlanticism and the secret of Nim. Right there in the meeting of the two characters, the black crow tangled in a red string. This stark imagery and knowing the backstory of Jeremy Crow is steeped in metaphor and symbolism. I'll get into that a little bit more as I pivot to focus on transatlanticism. So let's turn that magnifying glass to that. Why don't we? Transatlanticism is the 2003 album by Pacific Northwest indie band Death Cab for Cutie. It is often listed as the band's fourth album. 
unless you count their 1997 cassette, you can play these songs with chords as their first, which most rightfully do not. Transatlanticism is a concept album that explores the primary theme of a long-distance relationship, but is layered with secondary and tertiary elements of relationships, nostalgia, forbidden or secret love, and heartbreak. We'll start by looking at that distance element, which weaves in journey and transportation. The primary theme of distance is conveyed literally, symbolically, and metaphorically from explicit references to distance, which often touch on the difficulty of transitioning a relationship, and a sub-theme of transportation in general. The overlap between Miss Brisby's journey and Crow's desire to aid her along the way is not entirely unlike Gibbard, who is essentially the protagonist in this scenario, and his desire to go out of his way to make long distance work when its success seems utterly futile. Thus, the distance between the romantic lovers comes across on transatlanticism as something new, a sudden and vast amount of distance between the two people that is both physical, aka geographical, and mental, aka a distancing of the minds and emotional entanglement. And you hear this in the opening lyrics of the title track. The Atlantic was born today, and I'll tell you how. The clouds above opened up and let it out. Clouds opening up and letting it out. These phrases often associate with expressions of emotion, crying in particular. Time and time again, we get the impression that distance was not his choice. The physical distance gets a reference in the earliest moments of the opening track, The New Year, where Gibbard sings, I wish the world was flat like the old days, then I could travel just by folding a map. Here, that distance is explicitly geographical, and he continues, there'd be no distance that could hold us back, which tells me he believes or is trying to convince himself that long distance relationship will work. The hopeless romantic in full force. Believe me, I know. Then you have both title and registration and We Look Like Giants. These songs reference the automobile. In the former, he states that the glove compartment is inaccurately named. And in the latter, an emotive indie rocker during which he calls out that we look like giants in the back of my gray subcompact, fumbling to make contact while the others slept inside. Next, we have Tiny Vessels, which references both boats and blood vessels. And then there's Expo 86, which I actually attended in 1986 with my parents at the young age of six. Expo was short for the World Exposition on Transportation and Communication, and 86, of course, was the year it was held. It took place in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is just north of Bellingham, Washington, where Death Cab was formed. Let's pivot to love, longing, and heartbreak. What came first, the music or the misery? classic line by John Cusack, of course, stemming from the original Nick Hornby book, High Fidelity. The thematic journey in The Secret of Nim ties in nicely with the emotional journey Gibbard's protagonist must make as the relationship he puts so much effort into transitions to long distance. It's not a journey he wants to go on, but he's trying to make the best of it, so it's an emotional journey as well. I touched on that briefly when discussing the title track, and further expanding on tiny vessels, we get more of the same. All I see are dark gray clouds in the distance moving closer with every hour. So when you ask, is something wrong? I think you're damn right there is, but we can't talk about it now. So one last touch and then you'll go and we'll pretend that it meant something so much more. I don't know about you, but these lyrics to me are just gut-wrenching. Repeatedly, the conflict between the two characters arises in both self-sacrifice and inner turmoil on behalf of the album's protagonist, Gibbard, receives quite a bit of lyrical attention. This journey he doesn't want to go on, the grasping for things to stay the same, the bubbling over of emotions ranging from longing and nostalgia to small bursts of anger and frustration, it's all there. Throughout the album, there are these references to anguish and pain in the ending of a relationship, but also incredibly strong hints that the relationship was kind of one that was doomed from the start, or at least unhealthy at best. 
secrets, patterns of conflict, an emotional disconnect of Gibbard's romantic interest. All of these things point to and contribute to his inner struggle. We get this turmoil in Expo 86 as well. I'm waiting for something to go wrong. I'm waiting for the familiar resolve. And again, in the lyric quote, we slide from top to bottom and we turn and climb again, both referencing this repetitive, unhealthy cycle that the couple seems unable to break. While these elements don't necessarily hint at the Secret of Nim character Jeremy Crow, they fit the artwork and, to a lesser degree, his predicament. The tangled knots keeping the crow from flying free is an emotional burden that Gibbard cannot untie without a little help. Then there's the reference to secrecy, the secret of Nim, secrecy. There are hints of hiding this love and the relationship from others. And that reference you can find in We Look Like Giants, where Gibbard sings, I don't know about you, but I swear on my name, they could smell it on me, but I've never been too good with secrets. Lust and passion for his romantic interest overpowering the seemingly blatant disapproval from others. And the line itself makes me think there was some anxiety in those who disapproved finding out. Then there's the metaphoric joy that others have in the relationship ending or transitioning as heard in the title track, Transatlanticism. Most people were overjoyed they took to their boats. Gibbard is heartbroken that there's this ocean between them, either literal, symbolic, or mental, or all three, but others are overjoyed. About his own mental state, he sings, and the distance is quite simply too far for me to row. Let's pivot to the upbeat track, The Sound of Settling. My interpretation of the deceptively poppy track when looked at lyrically is filled with crippling conflict avoidance and suppression of one's boundaries. I've got a hunger twisting my stomach into knots and my brain's repeating, if you've got an impulse, let it out, but they never make it past my mouth. And the upbeat ba-ba, ba-ba, this is the sound of settling. Psychologically, there is so much depth in the metaphors packed into transatlanticism that it would take a licensed therapist years to unravel. Or, as referenced in the red string holding back the crow on the cover, you need a knot tying expert. Let's look at the symbolism of the crow. The black crow has a dualistic nature to it, symbolically. In real life, they are incredibly smart trainable and will actually bring you gifts. This is referenced in a more recent season of Rick and Morty when Rick ditches Morty and replaces his trusty anxious sidekick with two crows. To lean into the positive symbolism, the crow represents rebirth, self-reflection, intelligence, and loyalty. In the artwork then, the red string could be a restraining of the crow from achieving these things. To pivot, crows also have a dark side. They represent misfortune, danger, and other similarly not so pleasant things. Here, that red string could represent his inability to let go of the thing that causes the misfortune and danger, his romantic interest. As we found in the discussion of love and heartbreak, romance and conflict, this dualistic nature arises throughout transatlanticism and it's greater emphasized by the red string symbolizing the stuck nature of the protagonist. But we still haven't answered the question, have we? Let's pivot to the artist, the artwork, and what we know about them. Addie Russell is a Seattle-based artist who, at the time, knew Barsook founder Josh Rosenfeld. Josh connected her to the band as someone he thought would be great to construct the album's artwork. They agreed, and Russell put together quite a few different pieces in a variety of styles. Here's a quote by Russell herself. I had the expectation that either they'd find something in the mess they liked, or that the band would see how much work I'd done, that they wouldn't have the heart to say no. The crow on the album cover was actually found by Russell in a hobby shop. And here's a quote from Eric Ganswork writing for At Length magazine, and he describes the album's inner sleeves as follows. The striking image on the front cover, a soft focus painting of a blackbird ensnared in some kind of blood red string is simultaneously iconic and mysterious. The interior booklet reveals an abundance of representational painting, collage and assemblage, visually echoing the album's themes with 
repeated imagery of red ropey tangles reminiscent of anatomical textbook illustrations of arteries. Blown electric fuses, a hummingbird rendered in outsider art fashion, and a spectral human figure ambiguously situated in roiling water, narrowly cropped photos of train cars and other repeated elements. Now, according to Abigail DeVoe, who noted in her Transatlanticism 20 Years Later video on her Vinyl Monday series, if you haven't checked that out yet, I'll include a link in the comments or down in the description. Well, she notes that the red string represents the idea of the red string of fate. Essentially, it's a red string tied to your soulmate. She also doesn't reference Jeremy Crow, but this symbolism transcends both pieces the cover art, and the symbolism of Jeremy Crow, who is responsible for tangling himself in this red string of fate through his own obsessive attempts to find or keep a mate. In both the case of Jeremy Crow and Ben Gibber, the tangled red string represents this self-inflicted conundrum the characters have essentially gotten themselves into. With such an incredible longing and focus on seeking the soulmate and building their forever nest, both have achieved the complete opposite on their own doing. The red string of fate actually is a reference to the Red Thread of Fate, also known as the Red Thread of Marriage, from Chinese mythology. Here we get into a more Western concept of soulmate or the one. It's essentially this invisible thread tied between two individuals who are destined to be together. How's that for free will? This mythology varies between cultures. In Chinese mythology, it's tied around each person's ankle, whereas in Japanese culture, it's tied around the male's thumb and the female's little finger. So much great information, but it again leads to the ultimate question at hand. Is the album artwork of transatlanticism inspired by the secret of Nim? It's time for the answer. While the parallel between the two is Quite obvious, I have not been able to find any credible source stating that Transatlanticism's artwork was directly inspired by The Secret of Nim. But no one, to my knowledge, has done this deep of dive into the two and the parallels, correlations, and potential causations within. So my conclusion is that it's unsubstantiated and unlikely. Myth debunked. Let me explain a little further. I believe that what we're looking at is really just a correlation, not a causation. Correlation, obviously, being a mutual relationship between two things. Transatlanticism's cover art, the secret of Nim. In this case, I believe that a much more likely scenario is that both the symbolic representation of Jeremy Crow tangled in red string in The Secret of Nim and the Black Crow tangled in red string on the cover of Transatlanticism both reference the red thread of fate and that the use of the Black Crow by Addie Russell was purely circumstantial given the breadth of artwork that she uh, ultimately created and that the crow was something that she just stumbled upon in the thrift shop. Like Pickle Killa, I still love that name, I love the idea that the artwork of Transatlanticism could have been inspired by The Secret of Nim, and Gibbard's age would have certainly aligned with him having seen that movie as a child. Heck, my age aligns with that as well. But thus far, there is no known causation. Cool, yes, but debunked. What indie rock or just plain rock mystery are you curious about? Let me know down in the comments. I'm always fascinated by lore and mysteries and odd little connections. So maybe your comment will spark a future video. After all, it was two comments that led to this one. The 20th anniversary pressings are out now and you can find a link to those in the description, as well as a link to where you can check out The Secret of Nim. Next, take a look at this video right here where I talk about transatlanticism at 20 years. I'm Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel, and I will see you in the next video.